I'm Kevin O'Hara for AlcoholMastery.com and today I wanted to talk about some of the things that I've learned during the year since I quit drinking. Um, it's not going to be a, a short video, there's a few things I want to talk about so um, we'll crack on. Now it's not going to be a definitive guide by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I probably need a long long time to, to try and uh, put down everything that I've sort of learned about myself and uh, uh, about the habit in general but I'm going to try and uh, put down a lot of the stuff that I think will help people you know so some of the things that I'm going to talk about are that um, it's mostly in your head and it's mostly not about the alcohol it boils down to uh, you being in control of your actions um, I'll also talk a bit about uh, the symptoms and um, the discomfort with the symptoms that will pass eventually um, I'll talk a bit about the language of addiction uh, using words like alcoholic that kind of thing I'll also talk a little bit about um, alcohol not being a disease how it's a habit that's in your control and that in order to get to the other side of the the habit and break it all together you've got to believe in yourself so I think the first thing that you need when you first make the decision to quit that you're going to try to quit is to have that commitment there is to say well you know from this day on that's it uh, you know I'm not going to have any more drink I'm not going to um, put the glass to my lips anymore and that's it final it's done over from a commitment point of view there is start now and don't deviate start now don't deviate start now don't deviate next is it's not about the drink uh, we fool ourselves in so many ways when it comes to alcohol and we're basically fooled by um, the industry in so many different ways. I mean, if you think about the, the wine industry, for instance, and think about the language that they use, um, fruity and uh, deep and cheeky, robust, flamboyant, laser-like, opulent. I mean, what the hell do those terms mean? They don't mean anything. You know, if you look at the beer industry, they use words like nutty and malty and biscuity and lemony, um, hoppy. I mean, they're all describing not the beer itself, but the ingredients that they've ad added. You know, so it's nothing to do with the alcohol. It's the actual um, added ingredients, the stuff that is uh, really good for you anyway. I remember the first time I ever drank and the word that came to my mind on that first taste and it was a drink called Smithix uh, the first word that came to my mind was petroly uh, uh, you know like petrol it wasn't anything to do with um, uh, mal maltiness or hoppiness or anything like that it was petrol um, it was like I was drinking the worst tasting medication that anyone had ever forced me to drink you know but what did I know I mean when I was a kid when I was a young lad when I first drank I was 13 or 14 years of age and everybody all the adults around me were doing the same thing they were all drinking and they were enjoying it you know they seemed to be laughing and joking and stuff so who was I you know I mean they obviously knew what they were doing they obviously knew that um, you know it was something that you know you could do uh, it was something that um, strong people do and I must have been just a weirdo that I didn't actually like the taste of it so um, but I presumed and I was told by a lot of people around that I get used to it and stuff you know that it wasn't uncommon for people who just started out to not like the taste of it so you know you you persist then um, I remember listening to this uh, this uh, what would you call him a swami like a, um, an Indian guru um, and he was talking about the body from his perspective and he was talking about stuff that was going into your into your system um, he was a vegetarian and he didn't drink alcohol and he basically said that he said your 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 body is like a country and you've got certain immigration officials that are waiting to um, to uh, check everything that it comes comes into the country you know so he said your eyes are the first immigration or immigration officer and you know look at the the, the drink of whatever you're drinking and go yeah it looks clear stuff yeah it doesn't look like there's any dirt in it that's okay to drink and he said the next thing that you come then is your nose and you'd smell it and he said it's conveniently placed underneath your your um uh, or just above your mouth and instead of up on your forehead or somewhere like that and he said you smell it it smells good it doesn't smell off it doesn't smell bad 
so that's good so next put it into the third immigration officer and that's your mouth sip it taste it and it tastes good then you swallow it and it goes into the ultimate immigration officer which is your stomach and in the case of alcohol when you first drink it's always nearly always that when you drink a lot of this stuff it doesn't look the best I mean this frothy brown liquid that you probably never drank anything like it before definitely doesn't smell the best doesn't taste the best and as soon as you get it into your stomach and it goes to the fourth immigration officer he immediately says no you don't belong here and he kicks you out of the country straight out so it actually takes a big conscious effort to get the stuff into your body in the first place when you first start drinking and it takes a conscious effort to keep putting it in and putting it in until you develop this so-called taste uh, and before you develop you become used to it and you get habituated into it and you want more and more and more but it's not the alcohol it's not the alcohol that um, does anything it can't do it on its own it can't go past your lips on its own you know that's one of the things that I've learned is you know when people blame the alcohol it's just bullshit it's the alcohol cannot do anything on its own you know it's you that has to put it inside your mouth so from that perspective quitting alcohol is really really simple it's you just don't pick it up and you don't put it in it's the rest of it and it's dealing with the consequences of not doing that anymore anymore after a certain length of time that's where the problems lie the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, any claims that alcohol has got healthy benefits now there's no doubt in my mind at all whatsoever that alcohol um, doesn't have any benefits any healthy benefits at all to your body and there should be no doubt in your mind and this is especially when it comes to um, people like me and probably people like you who drink to get drunk that you know there's no other point to it and I know a lot of different people who drink and I can tell you for a fact that most people who drink drink to get drunk I mean what other point is there the taste of it it takes a while to get used to the taste of it so you know who would who would drink for that reason I know that certain people that drink for the uh, for the social aspect my mother was one of those she never liked to drink and you could see it in her face every time she she, she tried to disguise uh, her drink all the time you know she would put um, lemonade into it or she would put you know and tiny little drops of alcohol you couldn't put much into it she'd get drunk very quickly but um, you know she wouldn't she wouldn't want to drink lots you know she only drank once in a while the society that we live in um, I think 80% or something uh, something like that of the people that live in the Western society drink alcohol so it's seen as a normal thing to do but in all fairness there's nothing normal about putting poison inside your body you know there's nothing normal in it at all you know we kid ourselves into believing that it's something that is a natural thing that we do you know people have not been brewing alcohol for very long in terms of how long the human race has been on the planet but you know in all fairness alcohol is a poison I mean the, the, our bodies are not adapted to drinking alcohol uh, you know it's it's a it's a wonder why we're still alive I mean our bodies adapt to this continuous inflow of alcohol because it has to it's meant to to uh, keep you alive that's its whole function is the body is to keep is to keep you alive so when people talk to me about moderation um, I can moderate my life in so many different areas and I do moderate my life and I always have been able to moderate my life in that in that way but with alcohol it's a, a completely different story it's drink to get drunk now I don't see why anybody would want to moderate the drinking I, I just don't get that Now maybe that's a flaw in my personality maybe that's a flaw in my system I don't know um, do I think that I could moderate my drinking into the future I probably could yeah I'm not saying that I couldn't but why would I want to put myself through that kind of a hell because at the end of the day I don't see the point in drinking I think it's a, a poison um, and in order to moderate it's like you're continuously putting your mind and your body through this uh, utter torment for the rest of your life and nah that's not gonna happen uh, it's like get the poison out of your life treat it as a poison that it is and push it off you know 
Another thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the recovery process. Now, a lot of people assume that the recovery process is something that just happens after you've quit drinking. A lot of people assume that it's going to stay with you for the rest of your life, a bit like, um, you know, being an alcoholic for the rest of your life and, you know, being one drink away, this one drink that's up to here on the pedestal, that's that one drink away from uh, it all crashing down around you and you're back to square one again. No, that's, that's like a bubble that you're not in nobody's in that when they finish when they quit drinking um except if they if they put it into their own heads and they carry that with them then that's a that's a different story but the recovery process you've got two types of recovery you've got the recovery beforehand the cyclical recovery that your body keeps trying to put itself through and does otherwise you wouldn't be even here now it's like this you drink and your body tries to recover it tries to get rid of all the the alcohol inside your body and you know, it's it's doing this, you drink again, and it recovers a little bit, you do this again, it recovers, and, you know, but it's never getting past a certain level, you know, there's always alcohol, when I was drinking, there was always alcohol in my body, you know, even if I didn't drink for two days, then um, there'd still be the, the dregs of the alcohol, and the recovery process, the, the your body's system of recovery, my body's system was never, never able to get down to the, to the level of repairing, it was always... Um, damage limitation so that's the first processes of recovery that are going on while you're drinking now when you stop your body is allowed you're allowing your body to go past that initial phase so it's no longer in that cyclical one uh, it's no longer in the cyclical recovery that of the drinker it's now moved on to um, being able to get to the underlying damage that you've caused by however many years of drinking you've done so um, that's the type of recovery that you're going to notice only in the beginning. It's only when your body is getting used to not having alcohol in it anymore. It's when your life is getting used to not everything revolving around the alcohol anymore. You know, that's when you're going to feel it the most. After that, it all carries on underneath, you know, below the radar. So you don't really notice it until, you know, there's certain times when you think about drinking. Uh, there's times when people offer you a drink and it all comes flooding back and all this kind of stuff but you know apart from that you don't notice this this recovery process going on you know half the problem of getting people to stop drinking is to assure them that this process afterwards is not going to kill them is not going to um, give them massive amounts of uh, pain and agony and suffering and stuff it's not going to do that you're getting that now already you know you're getting this with this continuously uh, putting your body into this uh, loop of never-ending recovery you know afterwards that's when you escape from the recovery that's when you get the freedom recovery you know the process of recovery is a little bit then it gets lower and lower and lower as your body doesn't need it anymore and you're building up the strength in your body as you go on you can help recovery by feeding yourself the right types of food I mean if you think about it you have to uh, you know give your body the fuel that it needs in order to recover itself properly if you quit drinking and you eat mcdonald's hamburgers and drink loads of coke then you know you're not really doing yourself a favor um if you on the other hand if you if you uh, drink plenty of water if you eat plenty of complex carbohydrates that's um, whole grain bread uh, pasta brown rice um, all that kind of stuff you eat plenty of fruit and vegetables and only eat lean meat if you're going to eat meat at all you know oh, that's going to help you there's an old saying and that's you are what you eat in this case the uh, capacity that your body has got to heal will depend on the fuel that you give it so you know help yourself out and give it the right the, the right fuel to do the job at the beginning when i first gave up drinking i thought that i had to uh, hate alcohol but you know, looking back on it in retrospect, it just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, if I hate alcohol, I might as well hate the bars that alcohol is sold in. I might as well hate the glasses that it's served in, the corkscrews that open the bottle, you know, all my drinking buddies, that kind of thing. You know, at the end of the day, it's like I said, the alcohol, it's not the alcohol's fault. It's not the problem of the alcohol. It's the impact on your life that alcohol has made. You know, all those different things that you've done in your life in order to um in order to get alcohol into your life in order to allow it allow yourself to drink 
you know, it's a fairly negative way of looking at things. Like I said, you know, the alcohol itself can't get inside your body without you helping it. Uh, you know, it's not the alcohol, it's the way that alcohol has impacted on your life. It's the way that you've arranged your life so that you can drink. You know, there's so many different things that you do habitually through your day in order to drink. Um, all the brainwashing that we do to ourselves to justify the drinking. You know, I always remember my dad saying to me years ago that, um, you know, after he had to give up, he had to go and have an operation on it. He had a tumor in the back of his uh, back of his head and he had to go and have it operated on. And he smoked at the time 60 cigarettes a day. And he went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, the surgeon said, you know, well, do you smoke? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, I'm not telling you to quit smoking, but your chances of having a successful operation will double if, um, if you quit smoking and he quit smoking straight away no no hassle about it at all but afterwards he always used to say to me you know he'd say to me on occasion well you know if smoking wasn't bad for you I'd still be doing it you know and he was actually brainwashed himself and you know like I can't complain because I did it all my life myself you know I did it for over 30 years but this you know like we brainwash ourselves into thinking that uh, tobacco in a, you know like tobacco which is um, it's like a, a weed a dried up weed rolled up in a little paper tube with a, a little foam end onto it we put the end into our mouths set it on fire and breathe in the smoke and that's an enjoyable pastime you know if that's not brainwashing then you know what is you know how bizarre is that I mean if an alien was looking down on this planet and you know, like they'd avoid us like the plague. They'd be saying, you know, you want to see what these cookie feckers are doing down there, you know. But it's exactly the same thing as we're doing with the drink. It's a poison that's been put into a bottle or, you know, like it's been brewed up, made to look nice, made to, um, in nice bottles, nice containers, made to taste nice. Uh, and we're drinking this poison like there's no tomorrow. And we brainwashed ourselves into believing that it's, you know, it's something that we really enjoy doing. One of the best books for taking away that is, um, you know, any of the mysticism, any of the bullshit that we, we surround ourselves with. That In that sense is Alan Carr's uh, Control Your Drinking. He talks about so many different, he takes all your, your um, uh, previous misconceptions about um, that it makes you relax or it gives you confidence or, you know, all the different excuses that people use and he just breaks them down and says, well, yeah. It's all bullshit. So basically, it's because we're starting to notice the negative consequences in our drinking, um, that's the reason why we want to stop. And the negative consequences are caused by the poison in the, in the alcohol and by us drinking so much of it. You know, but how can it be the actual alcohol itself? It's not anything to do with that. You have to drink it, you know, and there's a big, there's a big difference. You know, you hear people talking about um, the demon drink and... Um, you know, they have to get away from this demon drink and, you know, like, it's all bullshit. You know, it's almost as if this, you know, problem has got nothing to do with them. You know, that it's, um, they sort of go out on their normal day-to-day -day business and all of a sudden this, you know, they're attacked by this alcohol, uh, this demon drink and, you know, it forces itself onto them and like some succubus, you know, and uh, penetrates them and gives them all these uh, this need for for more and more and more you know i mean it's people that do it to themselves and once you get over the brainwashing once you understand that you know that it becomes a different question for you you know you once you're aware that's the first the first thing is to be aware aware of the the real problem where the real responsibility lies and you know it's right inside yourself you know as long as we can pick up a bottle um pick up a can pick up a um, whatever you know as long as we can take the alcohol and hold that up and blame that then you know we're never going to get away from the problem we have to sort of look at where where the problem is originating another thing uh, about quitting drinking is that you can change how you react um, like I say a lot of the stuff that's going on inside inside your body inside your mind you can control it you can control it by your thinking, the way you're thinking. Um, there's a lot of stuff outside of your body which is going to be outside of your control.
but those things that are outside of your control you can avoid so you can still control it to a certain degree so in most cases all the symptoms and all the side effects and all the cravings from not being able to drink anymore are discomforts so it's basically your body not feeling uh, comfortable feeling uncomfortable with not being able to have a drink i mean when you in the previous you know the previous weeks when you were drinking as soon as you you felt uncomfortable as soon as you felt bored as soon as you felt whatever it was the automatic thing that you did was uh turn and have a drink you know like a robot it was you know what do i do oh drink more drink yeah i'll have another drink that was the way that you dealt with any uncomfortable feelings any uncomfortable thoughts it was like have a drink if you were worried have a drink you know if you're stressed out have a drink uh, if you were tired have a drink if you weren't tired if you felt like you were too much energy have a drink so quitting drinking is really about sorting your head out first and dealing with the discomfort understanding that it is only discomfort that your body is feeling uncomfortable um, and dealing with that you know it's really riding out the feelings of discomfort because they will pass you know I mean you can do it the opposite way around you can just think about it all the time and think how uncomfortable you feel you know I don't want to feel like this and oh you know that's you can have it in your brain all the time you know you can just mull it over and you know I don't like it or you can do the opposite way around and just do anything else to get away from the discomfort you know go out for a walk do other things you know and I know it's not that easy but if you take it as being it's not a symptom anymore it's not a um, a craving anymore you know it's not a side effect it's discomfort and if you look at it like that from that perspective then it just puts a whole new face on it I mean let's face it if you look at things from the perspective of a side effect you know or a craving you know cravings pretty bad I always associate cravings with this horrible um, uh, thing that I went through every time I couldn't get a cigarette you know I always a side effect was something that was definitely something that you wanted to avoid that was something to do with something bad um, you know and a symptom the same thing you know as a symptom of what it's like ooh, you know these are all things that don't have any it's like I said about the nominalizations they don't have any concrete um, thing but they are a process but we all have them as this thing that we don't want we definitely don't want that in our head we don't want a symptom don't want a side effect don't want a craving you know but discomfort you know it's a lot less it doesn't mean as much you know once you understand that it's it's uh, a part of the healing process you know you've got to change your mindset to that that discomfort is part of the healing process it's exactly like when you have a, a scratch you know if you get a scratch and after a while it'll start to itch like mad you know and that's what your discomfort is it's just this it's the healing process going on inside your body so when I say that alcohol is not the problem alcohol is just sort of the hub around which all these other things revolve um, you know you, the, the amount of time that you spend not only pursuing alcohol going out to pubs going to uh, your mates houses to drink alcohol buying alcohol to bring home um, it's also the amount of time that you spend thinking about it you know planning alcohol planning uh, your drinking sessions where you're gonna go uh, how long are you gonna stay there do you have enough money for it um, you know and even I found myself uh, sort of making up um, you know things so I, what would I tell people you know if I, I wanted to stay there for another few pints you know I said that I'd be home at a certain time but I didn't want to go home now because I was in the mood I had the taste for the drink which the taste for the drink came every night with me when I, once I was in the pub so it was always making excuses it was almost um, like I was having an affair and I was having to make up these things as I went along you know to make up excuse uh, uh, excuse upon excuse so with alcohol as with a lot of addictions it's the it's the 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 adaptations I mean your your body has become adapted to uh, you living your life around alcohol your life has become adapted to revolving around alcohol you know so if your life and all the the, the aspects of your life are a hub around this central thing when you grab a hold of that central thing and yank it out and pull it out and say right I'm not doing that anymore you've still got this hub and it's still floating around you know all these adaptations all these 
uh, actions that you used to do, all these thinking patterns that you've got are still there. And that is the problem. That's where the real issue lies. That's why I'm saying it's got nothing to do with the alcohol at all. You know, when it boils down to it, the alcohol is out of your system within a very short space of time. But these things, these things are fixed and rooted inside your, your, your psyche. You know, they're part of your everyday process. They're part of the unconscious process. And these um, adaptations are almost like a handicap. You know, I once heard a guy once said to me years ago that he'd, um, he described quitting uh, smoking as, um, as having one of his hands chopped off, as having his right hand chopped off. So um, you can imagine if you had your, your dominant hand chopped off all of a sudden then you have to adapt to everything, that everything is a struggle. You know, everything that you do in life has got to be, a, you know, it's got to be a struggle until you, you uh, adapt to something new. I mean, if your dominant hand is chopped off, you're still going to reach for stuff with it, even though it's not there anymore. And it's only when you think about, oh, shit, you know, like I can't, then you have to go with the other hand. It's the most mundane things that um, that you have to now be conscious of. You know, um, tying a knot if you've only got one hand, clapping your hands, uh, scratching your other hand, you know. I mean, that's an automatic thing that we all do, you know. We do it without even thinking about it. It's an itch. You lean over and you scratch it. Um, if you've got one hand missing, you can't do that. And it's exactly the same with alcohol. Um, you know, there's all these things that you've got to change in your life that you were doing in an unconscious way, you know, automatically doing every single day that you can no longer do you might still want to follow those tracks but you can't do it this i explained it to a guy there recently um that um it's like if you move to a new a new house uh in your old house you know if you lived in a place for uh, any length of time you get up in the morning and you uh go into the bathroom maybe you use the toilet you brush your teeth you come out of the bathroom you get yourself dressed you go in into the kitchen and you make a cup of tea a cup of coffee you make your breakfast you go down sit down do whatever you know and it's all like you could almost do it while you're you're in your sleep you know most people while they're they're doing this they they'll be thinking about the day ahead or they'll be thinking about the the latest football scores or whatever you know but it's it's uh it's this automatic Automat automaticity that's what it's called and um, this is the, the 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 thing that keeps you going throughout the day and it's like if you didn't have that you know imagine having to think about all those different things you know thinking about what do you do right you get up and which way right you go out this way uh, you go in that's exactly what happens when you move house is you wake up in the morning and instead of being automatically getting up and going out the door you have to think where the door is you know oh the door's over there so my bed's here now the door's over there where's the bathroom so you have to think where the bathroom is where's my toothbrush where's the sink where's the toilet you know all these things have to be thought out you go into the kitchen and automatically you're trying to uh, reach for the kettle which isn't there uh, and these things come about you know you you relearn them and the habits come back in very quickly you know so all those adaptations that you've made in your life have got to change you've got to deliberately change them you know i mean when you're walking past a, a, a pub for instance there was an old movie years ago called the quiet man and there was a character in it called michelino flynn and he was the local uh, matchmaker um uh, you know he arranged arranged marriages around the, the town and stuff and he was he was a heavy drinker this guy was and he had a, a horse and carriage and the horse stopped outside the pub you know and your man looked at the horse and the horse knew his behavior better than he knew his own and that's exactly how your brain works is you know you walk past the pub and it's like you'll feel the pull of the pub you know you'll feel if one of your buddies calls you up and says you know do you fancy coming out for a pint you feel that automatic urge to go i still get those every so often it's you know it's it's the weirdest thing and it's only during special occasions it's like something that i might do every once in a while like go to a wedding or um i thought i would get it at christmas but i didn't really get it um uh, i had it last year 
when a friend of mine called me up from Ireland and I hadn't spoken to him in a long time. He was talking about being in a pub uh, in Ireland and it just brought me a big flashback and it was that was the old habit surfacing up and trying to push me down this this uh, this road that I didn't want to go, you know. And I knew what it was straight away, so it wasn't there was no hassle with it. But I'm just saying it's it is that automatic response that is going to happen. Uh, and it's those responses that you have to really uh, focus on and deal with. But that's where the real value lies. Now, I know there is the physiological element, the physical element of the addiction, the, the alcohol inside your system. And that's going to take a little bit of time to, to get over. You know, you actually drinking the alcohol and the, the effect that alcohol has had in your body over the years. I'm not doubting that that exists, but it, it is only a very small part of the problem. I mean, as soon as you quit drinking, your body in the background is starting to deal with the process of recovery, of um, getting you better. I mean, it does that every time you stop drinking. So you go out in a session and your body is trying to get you better. That's why you go into a comatose state at night, because it can't deal with you being awake. You know, it can't keep you alive and keep you awake and functioning at the same time. So when you do quit, and you're not no when you're no longer putting alcohol inside your system, your body is um, is working furiously in the background to first of all get rid of all the alcohol and all the toxins, all the poisons out of your system, and then it's going to start to repair the damage that you've caused, and it's going to start to rebuild and rebuild all the all the um, cells that have been uh, that have been killed off or you know repair the, the damage and if you think about what your body wants it likes to be in stasis it needs to be on a balance you know on a level uh, as healthy as possible um, you know so all these so-called withdrawal symptoms you know the the uncomfortable feelings the feelings of illness or shakiness or tiredness you know that the body won't let you stay in that state for too long because it doesn't suit the survival instinct of the human body. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all wired still to be in the cave, you know, huddling around the campfire or whatever, and, uh, you know, protecting the family, uh, protecting ourselves. So, you know, to have you in a state where you can't run, where you can't protect yourself, where you're vulnerable, is, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense from, um, from a survival point of view. So... Your body is going to bring you up to that level, up to a healthy level, as soon as it can. I mean, it can only do uh, the job, it can only work with the tools that it's got. So, you know, like, um, I know that there was a lot of damage caused to my own body. And like I say, I was getting pains all over the place. I, I was overweight. And it took a long time before that, before those weight problems disappeared. Um, you know, and I've still got some of the excess weight on me from the drinking and from the, the eating shit food. But your body is all the time trying to get you into that survival um, fitness level, you know, uh, where you can run. I mean, it doesn't care about the fat. This is stored stored uh, uh, energy. And this is only, you know, the fat for me is it's a pure vanity thing. I just don't want it on my body anymore. It reminds me of boozing. It reminds me of my days when I, I was unfit. So, you know, from that perspective, I want it gone. But the real benefit of quitting drinking, um, the real value, apart from getting rid of the, the, the poison and the toxins and not having that in your life anymore, is that you've got an open you've got an open road ahead of you and you've got so many different avenues that you can choose which one to go down. I mean you've got to change all these things about your life and it's a golden opportunity to really rethink everything and think, well what what exactly do I want to do, you know? You know, to Sort of instead of doing these things instinctually and going through your life on uh, an automatic pilot, you can now start to think about things and put some meaning into your life. This opportunity, um, when you've quit drinking, is something that not everyone gets. I mean, you think of all the, the millions of people out there who drink on a daily basis, who go out drinking and will never consider themselves that they have a problem at all. And when you think about it in those terms, it's like the world is your oyster. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's the, it, it's almost as if the, that one thing, that alcohol thing, uh, and it could be 
many other different things. It's like that one thing was sort of was keeping everything else uh, um, attracted to it, you know, like a like a gravitational pull around it. And now that that's gone, you're sort of everything else is released. Your life is released, and you you know you're able to pursue these things that you couldn't do before. And I love the idea that you've immediately got something positive. You know that you're the one that has woken up out of this stupor, and that the thing that has been uh, holding everything together, you've yanked that out, you've thrown it behind you, it's in your past, all the shit's in your past, and now you've got the opportunity to, to, to go forward. I mean, that's what I'm always talking about, about onwards and upwards. It's that thing where you haven't got these big elastic bands holding you back anymore, that you're free to sort of choose the directions that you want to go in. And it's another reason why I'm saying that keeping yourself in that alcoholic loop, that um, um, calling yourself an alcoholic, saying that you're in recovery, calling yourself sober for the rest of your life, you know, um, is is not allowing you, it's still pulling you backwards into this alcohol past. You know, and there's no point in that. It's a destructive thing because it, it still has some sort of a pull on you and you're not completely free to do exactly what, you want to do if you know what i mean because you've got this this um this cloud still there you know you've still got this past that you shouldn't be dragging with you another thing that i wanted to address was um the fact that quitting alcohol is not going to kill you now i've done a few videos of this in the past and i've got some fairly serious comments as well saying well you know like there is a chance of of um of dying because of quitting drinking I understand that there is a small chance of you dropping dead um, there's a small chance of you dropping dead from crossing the road but the chance of you dropping dead that sort of it really equates to people who have been drinking so much alcohol that they get up in the morning and they drink alcohol they drink alcohol all day long until they pass out at night this is what they do I mean this is alcohol is their complete life I mean most of the people that are watching these videos um, they drink maybe a bottle two bottles of wine that might drink a load of stuff in the evening but that's basically what their life is most people have uh, a day life and they have this other life this drinking life and I know I'm talking about everything revolving around the other uh, everything revolving around the drink but there's there's a separation um, I know uh, I never went to the doctors when I quit drinking because I didn't want to give the doctor 50 euros to tell me what I knew myself that I had to quit drinking. Uh, so there was no point in going down to him and saying, well, do you know, do you think I should quit drinking? Do you think I, I, I might possibly die? I mean, I don't think he would be able to tell me anyway. Um, so what he's going to do is he's going to either tell me to go to AA. Uh, he's going to tell me to sign myself into some form of a dry out clinic, which I haven't got the money for and I wouldn't pay them anyway, you know. Um, and like I say, I don't think most people have got that um, that fear. They shouldn't have that fear. Um, if you have the fear, obviously go down to your doctor. You know, because of the world that we live in, I have to say to people, well, you know, like, don't take my advice. It's not medical advice. Go to your doctor for medical advice. Um, uh, but I can only tell you what I did. And I didn't go to the doctor. Uh, I think if if you can stop drinking for a couple of days, at a time and you're not really getting any mad symptoms then you're definitely not going to die through it you know again that's not a medical opinion but you know it makes sense doesn't it now I've done a lot of research about this online research um, I've typed in uh, deaths from alcohol symptoms deaths from withdrawal symptoms deaths from quitting drinking alcohol and the only things that I've come up with are people uh, celebrities that have died through overdoses um, you know different addictions uh, so not many people there wasn't many there wasn't much information about it but if you put in go to the internet and type in deaths from alcohol drinking you know so you, you have more chance of dying by staying drinking than you ever have of quitting drinking I mean your chances of dying when you're when you quit drinking are down here your chances of Dying, staying drinking are way up there, you know, way up there. Another issue which I touched a bit on earlier on was not calling yourself an alcoholic. 
I think that is one word which has stopped so many people from uh, from even admitting to themselves that they have a drinking problem. I mean, who wants to sort of say, well, you know, like if I have a bit of a drinking problem, then maybe I'm this thing called an alcoholic. And how they view an alcoholic, you know, it's different for everyone, but it's not, normally not a very nice thing, you know. Uh, for me, it's somebody that's sort of uh, a down and out on a park bench sipping um, uh, crappy vodka out of a, uh, um, you know, like a brown paper bag. You know, no family, no life, no nothing. You know, just drinking and waiting to die. That's an alcoholic to me. So, you know, like, don't call yourself that. The same as all those other words like uh, sobriety, sober living, uh, recovery, um, all those words are uh, they're keeping you back in the in the addictive mode you know they're keeping you back in this habit that you're trying to get rid of so I mean by all means say to yourself well yeah I, I am an alcoholic before I quit but as soon as you do quit you know get rid of it out of your life you don't need it destroy everything that you're trying to push forward another thing I want to talk about is symptoms um, it seems to be one of the most uh, common fears and one of the most common misperceptions about quitting alcohol um, you know people ask questions like what if I get headaches or how strong will my headaches be what if I get the shakes or how long will the shakes last or what if I can't sleep um, you know how long will that last and I get where you're coming from I get where everyone's coming from in this perspective um, you know it's, it's a, an inner thing that I think most of us have is I still have the same thing now with uh, um, I'm trying to lose weight and I've got this sort of inner voice inside me going well do you know like I'm, I'm hungry I want to eat that you know and it's like an inner whiny child that uh, we sort of have to get a handle on as I said it's part of the the whole um, using the language properly the language of addiction uh, which sort of keeps people uh, in fear of these things I mean, just the words themselves, the word symptom, the word uh, craving, the word uh, side effect. I mean, these are all loaded terms that don't actually mean anything, uh, but that can be interpreted to mean something monstrous, you know, something that's out of this world. And if you've got no experience of pain and suffering or anything like that, then, you know, like, it, you know, it could blow that out of all proportion. And, you know, a lot of people... The first thing that they do when they are attempting to quit is they look online and um, they see what's going to happen. And most of the stuff that's online is going to tell you about the symptoms, symptoms and the cravings and the side effects of you quitting alcohol. And this is the topmost part of their presentations is this is what might happen to you. That might happen to you. This might happen to you. All mites, 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 you know, and they can't tell you that it definitely will happen to you. They definitely won't be able to tell you. Um, the size or the magnitude of uh, your particular symptoms if you do get that so if you do get the shakes how big the shakes are going to be how long they'll last whether the shakes are going to come with sweats whether they're going to come with feelings of illness uh, I, what I got when I quit drinking I couldn't sleep I did get some shakes but not, not many couldn't sleep I, I uh, couldn't sleep for about a month um, and it was a progressive thing, so um, or a regressive thing. So it started out that I wasn't able to sleep for the first few nights. Um, you know, I obviously slept, but it was very fitful sleep. And then gradually, gradually, as you move into it and move into it, as the days become weeks, and uh, after about a month, I was able to sleep properly. And I had better sleeps than I'd had in a long, long time. It was a proper sleep. But the big thing here is to make comparisons you have to um put things side by side you know exactly what you were like before you quit drinking that's probably um exactly where you are now if you haven't quit this is where you're going now i remember back when i was drinking um before i quit drinking and my sleeps then weren't sleeps at all you know i'd go into the the, the bedroom and i'd be in a comatose state before I could, uh, before my head hit the pillow, you know, that was my body shutting me down so it could deal with the poison that was inside my system. 
Then I'd wake up, maybe after four or five hours of sleep, and you know, I'd have this. My heart would be literally trying to hop out of my chest. You know, I'd I'd have a banging headache. I'd you know be either roasting hot or cold. Um, I'd be down to go to the toilet, obviously. So I'd get up and go to the toilet, and then get back into bed and try and get back to sleep or try and get back into the comatose state, whichever it was. And I couldn't do that. Then. Once I'd got through the night, I had to wake up then with a banging headache. Um, most of my hangovers were taking two and three days to clear up, and they were never really clearing up because by the time uh, you know I, I, I got through that day, I was drinking again in the evening, or I was drinking the next day again, or whatever. But it was a continuous cycle. Um, but it felt most of the time like my hangovers were uh, were like flu symptoms, like a really bad flu. You know, like I would sit there, I would feel like vomiting. I would feel uh, like very sweaty, headachey. Parts of my body that used to wake my, you know, both sides of my of my uh, uh, torso, um, both my liver and my kidneys were were um, were sore. You know, my joints were all sore. My brain wasn't functioning. But, you know, like I, I'd sit in front of the telly or I'd sit in front of the computer like a zombie just staring at something, just not being able to do anything, think. My brain felt like it was wrapped up in a, a big wet towel. You know, the closest I can come to the actual feeling of uh, how I was feeling inside my brain was um, if you put on a pair of those glasses with the really thick lenses on them and uh, you can't really see through them, everything's a fogginess and it makes you feel a bit like you want to vomit, that kind of a thing. I was developing arthritis, I was obese, uh, my sex life was non-existent. So when I make personal comparisons between the before and the after, the symptoms and the side effects and the cravings, the unpleasantness, you know, the discomfort, that was a walk in the park compared to what I was doing before. And you know, like I'm not saying I noticed the effects straight away. Because it does take time for your body to adjust. It takes time before you, you you get rid of the alcohol out of your system. Um, but I did start feeling good after after a few days. I remember the first video that I did, and that was after one week um, that I quit alcohol. And looking back on the video now, I can see myself the way I was. I was you know like totally bloated out, and I just looked sad. Um, but I remember at the time feeling. A lot better a lot better about myself a lot better um, uh, I thought my, my outlook looked looked better looked brighter the best piece of advice I can give to you is if you haven't quit drinking you know look at your life now look at what it is like now you know like examine it in in all its gory detail you know sit down and and look at the different aspects of your life look at the pains and aches that you're getting look at the way you're feeling after you after you've had a drink you know, look at the way you're feeling. When you're drinking, I, I used to drink that much that most of the time, um, you know, I looked like some kind of a, a smackhead. If they'd have put me inside some filthy uh, hovel, you know, lying down on a on a uh, an old stinking mattress and stuff with a rubber band tied around my my uh, my arm, then that's basically what I looked like without all the the drug paraphernalia. But that was basically that was me. When I was drunk, it was like this out of my face, you know, nasty. You know, so take a long, hard look at yourself and look at who you are now and go into your head and visualize. Push yourself 10 years down the road and you're still drinking and imagine where you are then and really visualize that. Like I say, all the gory details, you know, are you still going to be around in 10 years time? But I can tell you from a year down the road, from a year since I had my last drink, I look back now and I think, how the hell did I ever get to that stage? How did I ever get to that stage? You know, And I'll never do that again. But I understand it now. And that's why I'm saying it's not a lot to do with the alcohol. It's the process of building up and just everything, you know, you build one part of your life and another part. And then eventually it becomes such a large 
influence in your life that it's difficult to to extract yourself from it but it's that process of change it's that process of extracting your, the, the alcohol out of your life first and then dealing with the twisted wires that are the parts of your life and separating them all out and sort of straighten them out and dealing with them and changing them that's what you have to do so like I say don't be worried about the symptoms the symptoms are what they are you know it's uncomfortable it's discomfort it's a bit of uncomfortableness in your life that you have to deal with um, you know and, and the price of being uncomfortable in comparison to what it was like before and it won't last long it'll eventually just pass away and you'll be free of it you get little symptoms as you're going along but there'll be nothing you know compared to it it's all all in the head from there on out you know when it boils down to it you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable for a while you have to be comfortable having a little bit of suffering in your life small bit in order to progress and to be free and you know you have a hold of the dial up here that's where you know you adjust to whether the uncomfortableness is going to be harsh or it's going to be easy you know it's all the way you think about it it's all the way you put it inside your head if you tell yourself it's going to be hard then it will be if you tell yourself it's going to be easy then it will be you know you know and just deal with it you know if you're if you're lying awake at night and you can't sleep then you know think about the the life ahead and plan your future and you know use your time you know you might as well it's a bit of extra time that you've got on your hands it's one of the preconditions of you succeeding in um, this endeavor is what you believe will happen will happen I mean everything that you do starts out as a thought um, everything that you do I mean even your basic fight or flight um, automatic responses start out as a thought of, of kinds you know you might not be aware of it but it does happen and it starts out as that impulse to do something and the way you talk to yourself in your own head is going to determine the outcome whether you succeed or whether you don't succeed you know if you tell yourself that you don't think that you're going to be able to do it you're basically sabotaging all your efforts whereas on the other hand if you tell yourself you are going to do it this is something that you are going to do you have that conviction and determination before you start then you know you can move forward into um, into the rest of your life and it'll be easier the last thing I wanted to talk about um, was that drinking is not a disease you know alcoholism is not a disease it's a bad habit that's just got them out of control um, as soon as you start thinking that it's a disease that is inherent in your genes or whatever that you can't do anything about it and that it's going to be with you for the rest of your life then you're doomed you're doomed to have this anchor around your ankle for the rest of your life you know if on the other hand you believe that it's entirely your fault and I don't mean by fault like some blame thing blame game I mean by fault that you've taken the responsibility on yourself for what you've done to yourself in the past then it's entirely in your hands you control it you know the disease thing you have no control over that because it's like something that's happening inside of you it's like a cancer or something like that and it's nothing to do with that you know once you've got the control of the drinking once you accept it as is under your control it's your responsibility then you tug it out of your life you get rid of it and you can then deal with what's left and you can deal with mending everything else so remember that it's not about the alcohol at least not all of it you know 95 percent of uh, the quitting process is going to happen up here inside your head you know you're you're at the controls it's up to you whether you crash land or whether you soar up into your greatest aspirations never use the word alcoholic it's so full of negative uh, connotations and it's just going to hold you back from following those aspirations and leaving the alcohol in your past you know, and that includes all the other negative uh, words that are associated with addiction I mean use language as your ally use language to give you the power don't use language that will give the power to the habit you know don't say things like the demon drink what does that mean it's just giving the drink this this massive visual image inside your head 
I mean, you know, demon to me is this big horrible thing from hell that's got loads of power, it's got big teeth, sharp claws, maybe got magical powers and can really do you some damage. You know, I choose to think of the habit part of my drinking as the golem from the Lord of the Rings. It's a sniveling little rat ass thing that's going, oh my precious, you know, and he's begging for survival. That's the way to, to, to visualize a thing and give it names like Ratworm or Slugfest or something like that, you know? You know, and don't think of uh, your symptoms or your side effects or your cravings. Think of discomfort. Think of a little bit of uncomfortableness for a while and then you're going to move on. You know, just as sure as the destruction that you've been wreaking on your body for all these years has stopped once you've stopped drinking and you're no longer an alcoholic the discomfort is the process of you becoming a stronger person and once you become that stronger person that discomfort will disappear once your body has healed itself the discomfort will disappear now above all believe in yourself you know, this is just a bad habit that has gotten completely out of control um, it's a destructive thing that you've been doing to your body you've stopped it now and that's it you're moving on aim all your sights at your future goal you know aim your sights at the person that you aspire to be and don't look back you know never look back at the shit that was going on before and there's no point in doing that live in the moment and plan your future if you're gonna look backwards at all only look backwards with the happiness in mind that you're now moving onwards and upwards into your future aspirations. I'm Kevin O'Hara for Alcohol Mastery.